So, hi. Um, I want to quickly record uh, the slide set, which is about beginning with C++, which is a talk I gave in German. So you still can see a little bit of German in the slide. Um, in my user group in Düsseldorf, and the target audience is really people who want to start with C++ or want to restart with C++. Um, so a bit like different, like our usually uh, audience is really targeted at beginners. And this is uh, the talk, and I'm really recording this now, right now, in front of CppCon in uh, Seattle. So um, let's just directly head into the slides and begin with beginning with C++. Um, so I, I could just, you know, this talk has to start with this slide. This is, you know, time traveling C++. Um, but with the new standards, you actually uh, have a little bit of a problem because every three years you have a new standard, so the time travel option isn't as good anymore. Um, that is also one of the motivations I uh, wanted to to just give you some pointers where to go. A little bit about me. I do C++ since 98, started back then because I didn't want to learn how to do typewriters. And um, today I mostly work uh, with meeting C++. That's my day job. And I'm kind of, you know, traveling the world as an evangelist for C++, etc. Being a community mentor, supporting user groups, and building a global network for C++. But um, yeah, usually in, in my daytime and my job, I have to lot a lot of people with, with intermediate and many experts, and especially also in, in the user groups. So in, in my user groups, there's mostly people which are, have the intermediate level and experts, and we have topics for them. Um, but rarely we do actually do topics which are also interesting to beginners. And also you kind of, from, from our perspective uh, as, as experts, it's kind of a top-down perspective to beginners. It's kind of difficult to, to say uh, what's good for today for starting with C++ as we already you know learned like 10 or 15 years of C++ and um, today starting in C++ is totally different because today the internet and video and everything is there. So I want to give you in, in this talk a few pointers on, on where you can uh, learn C++ and what, what, what are the good things to do and um, where you should look out for. Um, at the end, I have also a bit of a tutorial if I go. Oh, this is the next slide. Um, and at the beginning, there is a getting started section at ISO CPP, which just you know gives us a little bit of an uh, overview on how the foundation thinks you should get started there. Of course, you need a compiler, but the online compilers is actually everything you need for the start. And then if you want to have a, a compiler on the local box, you have to see um, how to bring it up to date. And that's a whole different topic I, I don't want to get into today. Um, but there's different uh, online compilers. And of course, mostly if you're, if you're like running a Linux or Mac or something, compilers are available. And then you can take a tour. And there's different tour options like, you know, Herb Sutter, um, Scott Myers also said something about has material on, on C++ 11 and there's um, various other things. Um, web resources I'm going to do a little bit more on than you can see here. And then and learn more, you see books and there's many more books le uh, listed. I'm also going to have a few slides on books here later. Um, but here's the one thing is a, a tour of C++. That's a small short book about C++, which really gives you a good overview over the language. And that's also one of the um, favorite book from, from Herb Sutter, I know, and Bjarne. So um, that's, that's like, if, if, you, if, you, if you're if you re-entering into C++, uh, that book would be a really good uh, and short read. And which brings me basically what I'm going to talk about, the agenda today. It's uh, First, I just want to have lose a few words about tools, and we're going to talk quickly about books. Um, the internet offers mostly the, the best content today, not very surprisingly. And of course, also, I quickly have to talk a little bit about standardization and then have a like a quick overview, not, not like a tutorial, just about some of the basics of C++, what you can do, etc. And let's get started with that. Just tools. Um, I already mentioned the online compilers. I think that's for beginners, really one of the best options to, to get started, to just to be able to experiment with C++. Um, there's two differences. Um, the Gotbold platform is known for 
displaying a sampler and I, I'm not sure how good that is for beginners. Um, but if you want to learn something, if you want to see how C++ at, at the end is translated into a sampler, that's where you should go where you can see like the, the real instructions which are executed by the machine. And um, other online compilers like IDE1 or Randbox are actually allowing you to execute your C++ code and Gotbold is currently not having that feature, but that's a future a feature which uh, he has planned for the future. And build systems, you definitely should take a look at CMake. There are many other build systems, but currently um, the trend goes to CMake. And if you're starting with C++, um, CMake is, is one thing you should have a look at. Um, and a short word about IDEs. When I prepared this talk, some people were like, oh no, don't talk about IDEs. Uh, people should only work on the command line when they were in their beginning. And other people are like, like what, no? Uh, and you know, they're more like IDE people and both has their advantages. Um, so at the beginning, you probably you know, can only do command line with CMake and stuff and build your own things. That's very, very good. Um, but IDEs can make your day a lot easier. And if, if you're looking for, for a fitting IDE, uh, Qt Creator and C-Line are very, very good uh, cross-platform options. And then there's uh, MS Visual Studio Community Edition and the code editor they have and some other IDEs. Uh, honorary mentions like Sevelope, KDevelope, CodeBlocks. Uh, CodeBlocks is one which I used in the past and Qt Creator is what I use today. Um, also code quality, uh, I quickly want to mention CPP check, which is a tool which gives you, uh, which scans C++ code and tells you what kind of things could be improved. And um, that's also probably a good thing when you want to check and have some feedback on your own code. Uh, that's one of the tools you could use. And Doxygen is a tool to use, which is used to document code if you have like foreign code or if you're working on a new project and you need to uh, get an overview on code, uh, Doxygen can help you with that. which already brings me to books. Um, the good thing about books is and if, if they really are covering the basics and if they're like a classic book uh, in, in a field, that does never change. So the book itself stays valid and it's really still a good book to buy even today. And there's well-known authors which you know write good, deliver good quality, care about their content and um, also they're available offline. Um, a lot of things, a lot of content today is on the internet. And if you're, if you're on a plane, if you're on a train and your, your connection is not reliable or you don't have a connection at all, um, then it can be very good to have a set of books to take with you to, to just to read and learn in those books. Um, of course, this comes with, with a disadvantage. Um, these books are not able to be updated unless, and even, 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 even if they are updated, um, then you would have to buy a new version. So, you know, Scott Myers does not ring on the, your door and says, hey, there's this, but Scott Myers actually has a page on his website where you can see the changes into his books. And um, yeah, so also books kind of, you know, they get old. I still own an MFC book, and which is like kind of, you know, historic, but yeah. And then standardization makes, I think, the, the whole C++ book area a lot more difficult because every three years we are now getting a new standard. And with that, writing a C++ book is a lot more difficult than it was in the past when we had like a decade with, where it was only one standard. Now it's every three years a new standard. And currently a lot of the books are only covering the new features. But also we, we need to have books which cover like advice on how to write code, how to write, uh, how, what, what is the step after you know the features, you know, how to write an application with that. Um, and there's three authors which I picked out. Um, two of them are German because this is a talk which I gave in a German user group. Uh, Rainer Grimm has a good English and German blog, but also his books are very good and his books are very up to date with C++11, etc. Um, Scott Myers, very well known C++, big C++ author. Um, I think it just his books are just the classics and he, he just covers the basics and is still, still true. His last book, Modern C++11 Design. And um, this is really a, a good book to, to have. 
but I think modern C++ 11 design will not teach you the language. So you, ha you, you have to have to, to, to different sources for that. And there are some things on the web and I'll, I'll get later to that. Uh, Boris Schelling wrote a very good book about Boost uh, called The Boost Libraries. And it's also available online. And maybe at, at some point you probably will have to deal with Boost if you write C++. So that, that's a very good resource to have. And then there's other book I have heard very, very good things about is accelerated C++. It's also a bit older. So you should be aware about the differences to C++ 11. So if you learn C++ 11 or if you're currently learning uh, and, and you buy this book, uh, you, you can always you know read a chapter and then look up which is different in C++ 11 or how things have changed. Uh, I have personally never read this book, but I have heard from many, many people I really uh, value a lot of good things about this book because this is really a classic and this is a book I have myself. Um, it's a good book. It, it's also a lot about tools, etc. But I think uh, one of the issues with this book is that maybe today uh, it has aged a little bit too much because with tools the versions are different, etc. Um, but I think it's still uh, a very, very good book and written very different from other programming books. So this is especially a good book if you're trying to get into C++ and already know different programming languages or if you are like trying to get back into C++ from the past. Um, and the next book, Modern C++ Design by Alexandra Rusko is a classic, spawned and heavily influenced uh, the, the era when Boost came and the modern C++ era. This is like really a classic. And if, if you know C++, if you, if you know C++ 11, etc. well, uh, a good exercise would be to, to have this book and to try to re-implement the examples as C++ 11 and see now how much easier it is now to write that code. And the last book, um, there's not a lot of books out there which actually give you an introduction into writing applications for C++. And this is one of the few ones. And the author is also a book author and very active in Boost. So um, that is, uh, I think, a good book to read if you have to handle applications and written in Boost or if you plan to write those. Um, and with that, we're already at the internet. And of course, the biggest advantage of the internet is that updates are like instantaneous and they're directly there and every good website is up to date. Um, Two websites I want to point out to cppreference.com and learncpp.com, more about them later. And there's many, many active blogs and I have a, a weekly blog role where you can find what, what is new on those blogs and you will probably find, need some time to, to kind of have your personal set of blogs you want to read. Um, which is also kind of the, the contrary to blogs. We have so many C++ blogs today that it's kind of hard to know which, which one should I read? How much time do you want to invest into reading C++ blogs? And uh, I think we, we still kind of should have more blogs which are also targeted at beginners. Um, and then yeah, cppreference.com is a page where like even like really experienced C++ developers are often there just looking at the details of the standard the new standard of the the things like vector or things new things like file system. Um, so this is really a, a quality reference, and it kind of replaces the old uh, C++ reference book which you had in, in you know which you had handy to to look up things. Um, nowadays we go to cppreference.com. Um, also, notary uh, honorary mention is c++.com also has a reference which is also good. Um, I, I personally prefer cppreference.com, but cppreference.com is also having a very good reference. You probably want, want to have to look, uh, a look at that too. And that brings me to learncpp.com. Uh, it's currently the only C++ tutorial page I know is maintained and well written for the new standards. So any of their chapters has uh, an exercise and you can do things and you get feedback. And so that's that's very nice. Um, something you really should, uh, if, if you're looking for a tutorial and a classic online tutorial, this is you should have a look at this page. 
and short plug for my own page. Uh, I mentioned the blog roll. Um, I also cover all of this in social media, but most of those posts you find on the blog roll. And mini C++ is a C++ conference which exists since 2012, but also now today a platform for the community. I do a lot of work for user groups, I have also a blog there and um, all kind of other things. And then, of course, um, forums and C++ communities. And there's a German page where I have kind of origin from C++.net. Um, then there's an English C++.com, which I already mentioned. Those have forums where you can ask your questions. Uh, there's a C++ Slack, uh, Learn, it's one of the channels if you're learning that's probably one channel where you want to go it's cpplungslack.com and if you want to have, if you need an invite which is you know probably what you need if you if you aren't yet on that uh, that is available under cpplang.now.sh and honorary mention for stack overflow but i'm not sure how beginner friendly slack to uh, stack overflow today is because uh, you know i mean there's uh, you know Many questions are answered, if you, but if you Google your, your questions for C++, you will find many answers on Stack Overflow. Also, I should mention Reddit uh, with uh, RCPP and RCPP questions, um, which will help you to, to also get an update and uh, kind of comments on, on articles. And at RCPP questions, you can ask your questions on Reddit. So which brings me to to the blogs again there's i found like three or four bloggers which i particularly find interesting arna Mertz and rana grim and jonathan bokara are writing about blogs which are usually interesting to 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 a german audience but also to that's why i also have jonathan muller in here which is an, another example for a good german blog um but there are many others, and if, if you want to find those blogs, there are like aggregators like my own uh, Meaning C++, which is uh, covered on social media and the weekly uh, blog role, and ISO CPP, which also has the uh, getting starting page, which we just saw at the beginning. Um, and then there's uh, theme blogs. This page isn't like totally translated. Uh, Microsoft has a blog, which is about Visual Studio, standard features, etc. And um, Qt has a blog, WX Widgets has a blog, though there's, there's lots of blogs. And then there's YouTube. YouTube has also a few dedicated channels, and I picked uh, my favorites. Uh, Jason Turner does a weekly C++ uh, cast on, on what he kind of you know, wants to, to, to talk about right then. Uh, it's called C++ Weekly. Um, then there's a C++ course by the channel. Um, Game Dev also is uh, the topic on his channel. Um, and I think it's like one of the few C++ courses on YouTube, which I really think is, is, is in a good quality uh, that you should uh, like listen into that. And it's not for everybody. Uh, Copper Spice has verschiedenness, which, you know, Michelangelo, they have different th videos, but they really invest in the videos. So you should have a look at it. But I'm not sure if it's like totally only for beginners. Um, probably only like if you, if you already know a little bit about C++, it gets interesting for you. Um, same thing about my channel. Um, I do interviews and in, in a live stream called Meeting C++ Live. Uh, last guest was Sean Parent. And um, then also I have a series called Just C++, which is just me mostly ranting about my own code and just, you know, talking about how I improved it or how I, how I plan to refactor it or how I refactored it. Um, and then there is Konferenzen in German, which means conferences. So we learn a little bit of German here too. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of conferences, not only my own, but yeah. So they, they post their talks online, which is Aufgezeichnete Vorträge, German lesson here. Um, and that's good, but also most topics are not beginner friendly. So if you're beginning, you have to look at through those videos and find your uh, favorite videos there. Um, podcast, the CPP cast, which is every Friday with different topics. That's what stands there in German. I really should have looked at those slides again. So uh, CPP cast is really an uh, awesome podcast about C++ and something you probably start listening to and learn every time a little bit, but it's also you know, not, not really targeting at beginners. So um, I think 
really it would be nice to have more content for beginners, maybe even from beginners. So if you're started or if you just started with C++ or did start a few uh, months ago, maybe think about starting a blog or something on YouTube. Um, that would be interesting. And then with videos, there's a few things I want to point out. And a few years ago for Microsoft, Kate Gregory and James McNellis did a day where they gave an introduction into modern C++, which back then was C++ 11. And I still think that is a very, very good introduction. And if you're a beginner, if you want to start with C++, this video tutorial, it's freely available. It's linked down below. Um, you probably should have a look at that, um, even if it's like, you know, from four years ago. Um, still, still a very good introduction, gets you really started, and James and, and Kate are great teachers. Um, also, Kate Gregory gave uh, for a few years ago at CppCon, as you see here in the slide, a talk about uh, teaching C++ and that you shouldn't teach CP, uh, if you, you shouldn't teach C when you teach C++. That's basically one of the things she said. But I think this is also a great talk for a beginner. It's only one hour. And if you invest that hour, you get to know how Kate Gregory thinks about how you should learn C++ or how people should teach you C++. Um, probably gives you a good uh, overview on what materials you should focus on and what things you should learn as a C++ beginner. Um, and of course, if you're teaching C++, this is a great resource. Um, I already mentioned the channel. Um, he has a C++ course and he just started an OpenGL course. So that's definitely a channel where you should have a look at if you're beginning with C++ and you're interested in game dev. Which brings me to standardization. Um, with C++ 11, the standardization has picked up and it's now every three years a new standard. And usually the committee also meets three years, uh, three times a year, not every three years. So it's really, the committee has really done a lot of awesome work in the last uh, year since C++11 came out. Um, so C++11 is uh, the, the basic modern standard, I would like to call it that. Uh, C++11, uh, but then was superseded by C++14, uh, which improves C++11 and makes a lot of your code write less. Um, so C++14 is the standard you should currently focus on as a beginner, that's my opinion. Uh, C++17 is the newest standard, brings a lot of new libraries like optional any variant file system and parallel SDL algorithms and a few uh, standard things in this language, which we didn't have previously, um, makes the life again a bit easier. But um, if you really want to get started with C++, C++17 is not a necessity to learn at the beginning. But that's your decision. You, you can either start with the newest or with the US previous standard. Uh, both are very, very well covered online and questions, etc. But also, you know, the job market. Um, that's something I wanted to cover. And there's still standardization in German above. So you can learn a little bit of German today. German C++ experts are also, you know, if you want to work in Germany, this, this is now very good. Um, so uh, C++ still has many jobs, but most are maintenance. And hence, I think that this is not a good, uh, you know, you should focus at C++ Dev now 14 if you start with C++. Um, still, there is in C++ 3 many jobs, and I hear people complain that they cannot find people for their maintenance jobs. But as a beginner, um, you should think about if you want to have such a job. Um, and then, yeah, C++ 14 is the current standard as C++ 17 isn't like 100% a standard yet, but C17 is a new standard, but is it really used in production? I don't know. Um, and so I think 14 is currently best, but we, 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 we move into a future where C17 is also very good, and probably by next year or in two years, you should learn C17. So it depends a little bit on your perspective. If you want to uh, learn, start learning today and just want to look for a job in two or three years, 17 probably is a very good option too. And um, all those standards build up on each other so that if you learn 17, you also learn 14. And so that's, you know, just how, how you want to learn things. And also depends a little bit on the platform where you're learning, like Visual Studio supports different options 
of C++ 17 and 14 than Clang and GCC. Um, so that that depends a lot on 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 where where you are with your C++ knowledge and what what kind of uh, system you're running. Which brings me to a little overview of the basics of C++. First, I think I should just tell you a little bit about the history of modern C++ and C++ 11. And then we take a look at the stack and the memory because uh, C++ does not have memory management. C++ has no GC uh, and there is no garbage collection. Um, and then I will give you a little bit of an overview of standard C++, the SDL, the standard template library, or the standard library, how it's called today. Um, so let's get started with that. So um, modern C++ roots are, in my opinion, the 98 standard, which is in the start not. But then after this uh, heavily influencing boost and the modern C++ design book, which came out by Alex Andresco, which you know, introduced many techniques with, with templates, etc., and made this available to, to the masses, kind of. Um, and then there were 10 years, or Java in Germany, so another word in Germany we learn, um, where Boost evolved and where we learned how to use things and how we should have things standardized in the standard. And then C++11 came, um, finally. And since then, we get every three years kind of a new standard shipping uh, with new features. And sometimes features aren't ready, like C++17 does not have concepts. Um, and so in, in the last years, many boost libraries went to the standard because of that. Um, but boost still has a lot of libraries. Boost will never run out of libraries. And there's new libraries coming into boost. So boost is not like going away. Um, and modern C++ is the style of the modern standard. So that's like really, this is a style which, which, which C++ has always focused on. And this is uh, the dominate style, which will always be in C++. And that's, that's the only style kind of which you should learn today. And this brings me to the standard namespace and auto. Um, just quick overview, just, you know, to, to, to display some things. Um, so STD colon colon is the standard namespace. And often in examples, you see using namespace STD, and that's actually something which you should not, you know, take into your code um, because it hides what is in the standard namespace and what's not. For example, like in this case, int isn't in the standard namespace, but string is. And why is int not in the standard namespace? Because we have to be compatible with C in this case. This is one of the reasons. Um, so C++, you know, kind of, you know, has a subset, which is C, uh, where it builds up on. But today, um, C++ is a language of, this, of its own. Um, like we have with C++ 11, a new feature, auto, which already was in the past a keyword, but now it's, it has a different use. And now it's used for uh, assigning variables and not having the, the programmer declare its type. Um, so you can see like if you have an, integ an integer, you can say auto x equals five. Of course, now you have to type one character longer than you're saying, why, why, why should I do that? But if you, if you declare something else like an iterator, um, later I have a slide on what, what that is, um, you say simply auto it and you say like this, this is the object and you, you say dot begin and you get the iterator. And in the past you had to type the vector, the type, and then the, the iterator. So you, your code gets a lot concise, a lot more concise, a better readability. And this is one of the core future, uh, features of C++11 is auto. And some people say that you should have use always auto and some people say you shouldn't do that. But like, uh, that's something you have to make up as your own. Um, I'm not gonna go down this back chat now. So that brings me to the stack and memory uh, in C++ or you know how, how it is on the machine because C++ actually runs on the machine and, and not in, in some environment. So C++ code gets translated into machine code and it's done running on the machine. So and when we when we write code, we actually access the machine memory kind of things when, when at runtime. Um, so you see this block between the braces. And if we enter the block, 
um, this integer is being declared and this is a 32-bit platform so this integer is 32 bits which is 4 bytes and we assign 0 to this so every bit in those bytes is 0 and when we leave the block the integer is gone again that's the basic principle of how we do things with memory in C++. Um, we store in these scope st stack scope blocks everything and then um, once such a block is closed the program kind of guarantees that everything is cleaned up that's how it works that's the ideal and yeah, each of those cells is one byte and one byte is eight bit and mostly because there are some exotic platforms which have different things but that's that's not a topic today um so as as i mentioned we kind of you know use a stack instead of gc that's kind of there's no garbage collection um and so everything in c plus plus is usually part of such a scope block and variables are usually moved between these scope blocks like for example with function arguments or is returning variables from a function call. So a function uh, has also one of those scope blocks where it, where it just basically runs in its body and that returns from that. Um, there's one exception for that and that is the heap. Um, in C++ you allocate your heap data with new and that is also where the most of our, our mem leaks are originating from when you uh, do not deallocate things which are on the heap correctly and we're going to have a look at how c++ today and modern c++ prevents that from happening so speicherverwaltung is like memory management um so stack oh this is like a complete german style this is now advanced okay so at, at the right on the code we see a new new int is a mem leak and that is of course you know how it should not be so um that's why you do not call new directly in c plus plus 14 and c plus plus 11 that would be still okay if you assign it directly to a smart pointer which is in this case a unique pointer and um in C++14, you should then use make unique, so new is not any more visible in your code. Uh, make unique calls internally new, which is okay, but that's then left to the standard and not like to, to the programmer like you. Um, and this principle is also known as resource acquisition as initialization or RIII. And now if we do this with make unique, we can see uh, how the example is differently now. Now we allocate the heap and we see that this integer which has a value 23 is somewhere in the heap and somewhere in this uh, unique pointer there is a pointer to that heap. And that's but um, the difference is that this unique pointer is on the stack of this local block. So if you leave the block everything is deallocated correctly and that would also happen if you leave this block in a different form like when an exception is thrown an error occurs and even then the memory is cleaned up so that is why C++ does not need a GC uh, as this is basically uh, guaranteed as long as uh, the program is formed in this manner so and then there's of course also hidden heap allocations which are not that visible um, i think you should know that uh, things like you know standard containers like string vector etc if they grow they have to put that data somewhere and that's not magically put on the stack that is usually put on the heap um and i would like to show you a quick overview on string and vector just to to show you how to use basic types in c so first example is std string um, we create a string variable, we write it to C out, and then we add from C, which is German from like from C, 
and uh, this example then again writes it to C out and so this uh, puts on the console first hello world and then hello world from C++. So when you use strings in C++, you should use std string because it's so much easier than allocating and deallocating your strings in C and using all those C functions. Um, that's how we use strings. And I know C++ isn't the best string class, but that's a different topic. Um, regarding arrays, we have vector and vector is your dynamic array. If you have, have the need of an array which needs to grow, uh, think about using vector. Um, like, you know, well-known functions as pushback, popback, erase, and clear, and you totally can look uh, on CPP reference uh, different functions for vector up and how, you, how to use them. And there's also usually an example which you even could execute on the page. And actually the next uh, slide is an, an example of std vector, which I took from there. Um, and then std array, if you take, if you have a traditional array, uh, you could also today write uh, an std array which has, for example, uh, the advantage that it's an array type and gives you a little bit more security and a bit more also the interface of an STD container, which makes it a bit more better and easier usable with the standard algorithms, which is also one thing which we want to cover in one of the next slides. First, we have uh, this example from stdreference.com about STD vector. Uh, many other classes have similar examples there. So if you're really interested in C++ and want to know the standard library, uh, spending an evening on cppreference.com can really teach you a lot. Um, so in this example, we see we have the vector, which has four values and two values get added. And then every value of that is printed to see out and we see the result. Now, if you want to use algorithms, that's how the C++ programmers manipulate uh, containers which have data in them. Uh, for example, easy examples, um, sort is an easy way if you want to sort it. I think it's kind of clear. But you also could like call reverse on it and there's other algorithms. And um, for example, if you want to find an element, uh, you could call std find with like a value and now we find the element with the uh, value eight. And you also could call std if, which takes a lambda and um, in this case, this will look for, for an element which is smaller than eight and will re return the first element which is smaller than eight. And um, those find functions usually always only, you know, give you like the first element, not like all elements, that's a different thing. Um, then we already see this, uh, these find functions which we see here, they give you an iterator. They don't give you the element, they give you the, the iterator, which is kind of a, an abstraction around that to, and what is that? So an iterator is uh, an abstraction to access elements in a container. Um, containers like just vector map, etc. And you usually, you know, begin end and other things which give you a vector. And then there's C begin, uh, C end, a constant iterator, and R begin, R end are like they were, uh, are reverse iterators if you want to iterate over uh, an, a collection which has like, you know, from, from the begin, not from the begin to the end, but from the end to the begin. And a simple example in the code as, you know, so this was out to it for begin, you would get the beginning of the vector. And with uh, the star, you can kind of obtain the value of uh, the iterator, which which it currently is, is at. Um, you also can increment or decrement an iterator and stuff like that. So, um, but you also, with, with, with the arrow, you could access um, member functions and members of that iterator, which if you look at like examples at um, cppreference.com, etc., then that's fairly clear. Which brings me quickly on um, how to access all elements in a container. And you can use this with a range four, which came with C++ 11. It's kind of easy. But one thing is like you should per default have your elements constant. And if you want to change the elements, then you should not make them constant. But um, by default, you the, the default should be always constant. Make your variables and everything you use constant and then remove the constant if you need to. Uh, 
actually change something. Which brings me to constant and variables um, and function arguments. So constant is important in C++ and you should always use it. Um, so you can declare certain things as constant and um, then you can kind of end on the loft side so you cannot change that to, to the runtime. This, and um, constant and function arguments is like um, the first example with output, uh, the s plus equals nope does not work, does not compile. Uh, if that wouldn't be constant, that would work and you didn't want to do that. So uh, it's also a kind of one thing to, to have interfaces which you know guarantee that your variable which you give them is not changed. Um, and on the other hand, you could then create a new value with like this add super function, which just adds super to the string and returns this as a new string. Well, the actual string which you call this with is not changed, but it creates a new string which contains the old and the added string. And this brings me to functions. Um, functions make code reusable, which is very important if you're in a program and don't want to you know, reinvent the wheel all the time. And in C++, the basic function um, interface is you, you have a return type, you have a function name, and a parameter list. Um, there's also a, a newer um, syntax with, with auto and an arrow, and you can look that up in, in the C++ guidelines at cppreference.com. Um, and yeah, so the return type void returns nothing, and if it's not void, it returns something. Um, then there's a name, which usually is you know, a letter plus alphanumeric, um, a parameter list, which is optional, and parameters in, in a function should be const, which brings me to calling conventions. Uh, a parameter to a function can either take, a function can take a parameter either by value or by reference. You usually should prefer by reference because that's a lot cheaper in, in the code. Um, and but here as an example, we see like an int. Um, you can take that by uh, by value as it's a, it's a small value, and, and larger values you should take by reference. Um, so you kind of have to know what size uh, a type has to to make that decision. Um, so the first call to a does not change x. X is still zero, and after you call it with b. Uh, x is, is equals one. So this is a, this is also the other thing. If, if you if you take uh, if you make constant uh, the integer in b, uh, that wouldn't work as it wouldn't compile. And of course, you also in theory could use pointers as you see below. But no, let's just let's not talk about that. Um, and I quickly wanted to say something about templates because this is an overview and it wouldn't be complete if we wouldn't talk about templates. Templates are a very useful thing to not write too much code. As you see, like all this code and, and, and see where you would have to write this function again and again and again, or make it a, a macro, which is also not what you want. Um, then in C++, it's one simple uh, template. And that's also, you know, there's some other things with template, but this is just an overview. And this brings me to classes and classes. Um, this is basically how objects are modeled in C++. There's two different keywords for that, struct, which comes from C, and class, which comes from C++. And the difference is in the default of how public or private are members um, by, by default. Uh, and also, the compiler generates default members in C++. I should uh, quickly inform you about a constructor as a default constructor, and a copy constructor, and a destructor. And then also the operators, which is an assign operator and a move operator. And I'm not sure if I forgot one or not. Um, but also, as you see, it's getting kind of complicated. And that's why you probably should continue online at like pages like Learn CPP, um, listen to C++ Weekly, maybe give Chernus course a try if you like that. There's a course from, McNell from James McNellis and Kate Gregory. And cppreference.com is, I think, a very good page just to, to, to learn things, but also to look things up. Uh, it's also used by, by people which are at the expert level. Okay, Not, none of the experts like know everything in C++. Um, and then there's, of course, my own page, meaning C++, which is a conference, and use blog by blogs, social media, etc. 
and ISOCPP, uh, which also kind of features uh, news and blogs and also has a conference at CPPCon. And with that, thank you for your um, attention. Um, I, I've done, I've, I've put this slide set together to, to give uh, people a start on C++. And I hope to to improve on that and to to kind of refactor that in order to to to, to get that also on meeting C plus plus as a page as you know I want to also have such a getting starting page and maybe we can also update the getting starting page at isocpp.org. Um, so with that, thank you for your attention and see you next time at cppcon or meeting C plus plus or wherever you go. See you.